Today we'll take a look at all the different ways that brow lifts are done, and I'll let you know what my preferred method is. This video has been sponsored by Skillshare, more on them later. We've all seen the bad brow lifts out there, they leave people looking very surprised, Sometimes it also creates a more feminine type of appearance. Also, it can make people actually look older because it can hollow the upper eyelid area. So let's discuss eyebrow aesthetics. The eyebrow should actually overlie the orbital rim in men and it should be several millimeters above the upper orbital rim in women. Men tend to have a heavier, thicker brow with less arching. The medial and the lateral ends of the brow should lie approximately at the same horizontal level. In women, the peak of the arch should be somewhere between the lateral limbus of the eye and the lateral canthus of the eye. In terms of eyebrow aging, the lateral eyebrow tends to descend more than the medial eyebrow. And the reason is because we have one muscle that raises the eyebrows, and that's called the frontalis muscle. The frontalis muscle doesn't extend all the way to the side of the eyebrow. So beyond a certain point, you have what's called the depressors of the eyebrow that actually lead to pulling down of the eyebrow. Also, you have fat in the temporalis compartment here. As that fat declines over time, there is also a tendency for things to sag out to the side. As far as brow lifting in relationship to an upper blepharoplasty, it's important to consider doing a brow lift first before doing an aggressive blepharoplasty and the reason is if you remove too much upper eyelid skin it can leave the upper eye looking hollow so oftentimes the brow lift can be done first putting the upper eyelid in a better position and then usually less skin needs to be removed from the upper eyelid there are different options for brow lifting there are non-surgical options and surgical options we're going to go through all of the main options now starting with non-surgical the first option is Botox. Botox is a type of neurotoxin that paralyzes muscle. The target of Botox is the eyebrow depressors, namely glabella and crow's feet. The main lifting effect is out lateral and has a maximal lift of about five millimeters. Now, it can sometimes appear like you have additional extra lift out laterally here if the forehead is injected with Botox, but only the central forehead because what happens then is that the lateral frontalis will lift the lateral aspect of the brow, but it starts to look unnatural because usually then you can see creases on the lateral forehead and things don't look great. So if the forehead is being injected at the same time as the crow's feet and glabella as part of a, an overall complex to lift the eyebrows, the lateral forehead ought to be injected as well so that you have a more balanced type of lift as opposed to that unnatural type of lateral sweeped up look that happens when only the central forehead is injected. Botox will last about three to four months, so it has to be repeated. And the main complication that we think about, other than just like some bruising and swelling, which can happen for a few days, is blepharoptosis. And what that is, is a droopy eyelid from the migration of that Botox to affect the levator muscle. So if that happens, then you get this droop to your eyelid that tends to get better after about three months. The next non-surgical option for brow lifting is filler. Most fillers used in this area are, are hyaluronic acid or HA fillers. And so if Botox doesn't provide an adequate enough of a lift, you can use filler for further, especially eyebrow tail, elevation so that's the lateral aspect you can improve eyebrow contour and volume in this way you want to avoid significant temporal filler some people put filler into this region hoping that the whole area sort of balloons out and elevates the brow but then it just makes the head just look too wide in that region you have to be careful not to inject into the medial brow because there are some key vessels that live there and one of the dreaded complications of filler on the face, especially in the medial brow region, would be vascular compromise, where you get filler that goes into a blood vessel, and there have even been cases of blindness. Next non-surgical method for brow lifting is threads. So threads these days tend to be made out of PDO, which is a dissolvable type of material. Sutures are also made out of that material. These PDO threads are placed usually um, out laterally again to lift that part of the eyebrow. There's an inflammatory reaction that occurs that causes some internal scar tissue and a slight lift. 
usually it's quite temporary. The most common way to do the fox eye kind of trending brow lift technique is with threads. I do not recommend that technique. I don't find that it holds up over time and it can give a quite unnatural appearance, but that is the most common way that that fox eye look is achieved these days. The main complications of threads are skin puckering and the possibility of an infection. Before we get into surgical brow lift options, I wanted to tell you that I've always loved learning and teaching, which is why I started this YouTube channel. With my background in art, I discovered a course on Skillshare by Emily Armstrong that goes into detail about drawing portraits. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for anyone who loves learning and wants to explore their creativity and learn new skills. Invest in yourself and your personal growth. My creative journey took me through the phenomenal course by Emily, where I learned a lot about drawing portraits. The course even included an analysis of the face, though different from what we're doing in this video. Skillshare offers a ton of courses, from photography and illustration, to graphic design, freelancing, and more, and you can find classes that will match your goals and interests. The first 1,000 people to use the link or the code Dr. Gary, that's Dr. Gary, will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare. Be sure to sign up for Skillshare by clicking the link in the description below and start learning some new skills today. Thank you Skillshare for sponsoring this video. So now we're going to go over each of these surgical brow lifting techniques on this model. Here we go. So the direct brow lift approach that involves an incision right along the border of the eyebrow here. So usually a more lateral extension is needed here and we would do something along these lines. It can sometimes be different depending on how much we need to remove but by removing this amount of tissue this eyebrow will then swing up so you can see as I'm pulling from here you can see movement of the eyebrow so imagine cutting out this skin and resetting this to a higher point the incision ends up being right along the top here so that's where the scar ultimately forms and if someone has thick eyebrow hair it tends to conceal the incision and the scar quite well. Next technique that we're going to review is the mid forehead brow lift and that involves an incision that's made in a crease of the forehead. So the forehead creases usually don't extend all the way over and that's because the frontalis muscle as you can see here on this view extends up to this point here right there's this area this temporal crest that is separating the temporal compartment from the more central compartment. And where this muscle ends, um, we no longer will get those horizontal creases. And that's exactly why if we use a mid forehead approach and we make an incision in a crease, if there was a crease on this model, there really isn't much of a crease, but let's say we made an incision right along here and we hit it well into a crease, you can see that there's a point where you're not executing any change. So you're going to get some lifting, but it's going to be more of the central brow than the lateral brow. That's the mid forehead lift. Then we have the pretracheal lift and the trichophytic lift. So the pretracheal lift is directly at the hairline itself, right in front of the frontal hairs. This is meant to symbolize the hairline, by the way. This model doesn't have hair. So uh, we symbolize it with this line. So the pretracheal incision has to do with an incision right in front of the hairline. The trichophytic incision is just behind the most fine hairs. So to allow the hairs to grow through the scar as the incision heals. So they're very close to one another. So that's the pretracheal and the trichophytic incisions. When those incisions are made, you're lifting all of this up and you're exposing something that kind of looks like this area underneath and you're at tunneling down towards the brow to then cause lifting. So then we have the coronal brow lift. The coronal brow lift involves an incision further back behind the hairline, something like this. So it's, it's well hidden, however, this can cause quite a bit of alopecia or hair loss further back here. Uh, and then once you make your incision, you've got a tunnel all the way from back there forward 
down to here to release all of this. So all this skin gets peeled down and then this gets released and then pulled back and some extra tissue is removed and then this is sutured down. Not a popular technique these days because of all that extensive work. And when you do this from all the way back here, you're going to cause some degree of hairline elevation. There's going to be some recession that occurs. The next technique is the endoscopic brow lift. For the endoscopic approach, you have several key incision sites. Usually you have about five of them. And they start laterally here in the temporal area. There's one incision usually angled this way to allow you to then get to the lateral brow. Then you have other incision points. One would be here, somewhere in the middle of the brow, and one is usually in the center. The reason for these different ports is that you need to get uh, different items into the area. So one would be your elevator. So when you're doing this endoscopic stuff, you have one uh, hand that controls an elevating type of piece of equipment, and then you have the actual camera. And the camera, and sometimes there's a, an irrigation type of thing that's attached to it. So that has to go through one of the port, and then your hand with the elevator is in a different port and that's why you need these multiple points of access. Now, another way to do it is with an endoscopic style of lifting. So that's using these incisions or incisions that are placed just at the hairline itself that tend to heal quite well. And using those ports, you're able to then go in and do the elevation without necessarily the use of endoscopes. And as you do that, you're able to release all of this. Um, the orbital retaining ligament is, uh, if you look on this side, is going to be this area here. This is bone, but the ligament that, that lies on top of it is going to be orbital retaining ligament. All that gets released and that allows the brow to, to move and to elevate. And then next we have the lateral only or the temporal lift. And this is my more preferred method. So this involves an incision. Again, this is a fairly receded type of hairline look on, on this uh, mannequin. But basically you have an incision that's maybe a little bit longer and it's around on the same trajectory as the lateral brow that you're trying to lift. So you're lifting in this in this manner. This is an arrow here. You're lifting in this manner. So the incision is made here. It's big enough so you can get a retractor in and really visualize what you're doing. And you're tunneling down to here again, releasing the orbital retaining ligament, causing this to shift up. And then you're suture securing everything down here on the lateral aspect and you can take an approach like i said under the skin which is subcutaneous or a deep approach which is all the way down onto the uh, temporalis fascia and that allows you to have a more robust type of lift since you like this video on brow lifting make sure to check out our video on how facelifts are done